Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hi, everybody. Hello. Oh, my partner in crime is back. Finally, it's good to be back, Michelle, with you. Nice to have you back. So guys, All um, right. here we go. Let's go into um, some questions. All mm-hmm. right. Ready? I love that first question. It's such a good one. Why does anxiety make you feel like your reality is different? Do you want to answer that, Michelle? Should I start first? Oh, yes, sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, short answer is that anxiety creates this over-perception of reality. It's like turning all the lights on mm-hmm. and everything mm-hmm. is so much brighter and all, all your sense and senses are so heightened. So seeing and hearing and touching and feeling and processing thoughts and memories and sleep is off. And all of these things do happen together. And our brain is just not made for being focused on everything at the same time, all the time. We would burn out quickly if we would do that over months. Usually you focus on one thing. I'm talking to Michelle and I'm not actively noticing that there is this light in front of me. But if I would be anxious, I would like, oh, this is so disturbing. I can't focus on Michelle because there is this and there is that too. So your senses are so heightened. And that usually creates this feeling of something's wrong and I'm I'm losing kind of grip on reality or just something feels very, very off. And as I've said so many times, if we feel something is off and we don't know why we do not give our anxious mind an answer that it is satisfied with, it will keep asking all the time, but what is it? Could it be this? Or could it be this? And this goes on, on and on. And and those questions that Lauren in the back of your head, they do sensitize you more. And then this loop starts spinning. The more you sensitize, the more you notice things. And then the more you worry about why you are noticing so much. Mm -hmm. And this is how it goes on and on and on. Right. A heightened state, you know, you generally don't notice a heightened state when there's a danger to look at. So the heightened state's useful. And so no, most people aren't concerned about a heightened state as they're about to be in a car accident or as the bear's running towards them. You're generally not aware of the heightened state. A heightened state is heightened awareness for the danger. And so mm-hmm. that's why when there's it's anxiety, that means the danger piece is missing. Now you're just aware of being aware. Now you're like, again, the anxiety is designed to focus, kind of put blinders on your face and go, oh, yeah, look at this, look at the thing that's about to kill you. So when you have blinders on, I mean, your body physiologically does a lot of different things. Your pupils dilate, you take in more sunlight and your, your focus is honed in on danger, right? You have tunnel vision because it works great to get rid of distractions so you can see bears. But when there's no bears, you're left with this weird, this is where I think the beginning of like DPDR will start for somebody when they're like, they'll have that whoosh and they feel that, I don't know, for me, it felt like my head was sucking back into the universe sort of. And this weird like mind warp, like somebody pulled the front of my head and pulled it back at the same time. And you're like in two different places at once. You know, that's just your body's reaction. If there was actually a danger to focus on, I would not have noticed that state. But like, again, why does it make you feel like your reality is different? Because you're in a fight mode, but when there's nothing fightable, you've now entered like this virtual reality state where it's like everything feels important. And it's, like, it's mismatch, but, yes, right? Yes. That Between reali- reality and perceived reality. And you do not do you notice both things at the same time. So it, with your emotional brain tells you, oh, everything is, is something's off, something's off. Well, at the same time, your rational brain is like, yeah, but clearly nothing's off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then that mismatch can, can, well, obviously cr- creates anxiety, which is normal. But this is the part where you then need to to step in and, and diffuse those fears and those thoughts and say, oh, yeah, this is anxiety. This is fight or flight. This is what a heightened state feels like. All right, it's going to settle itself down. But this is exactly where people go wrong because they're like, oh, God, now let's try and figure this out. 
mm-hmm. where is it coming from? And this is how you stay in 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 that loop. All right, guys. All right, yeah. num- next one. Um, and so they submitted and then submitted a secondary one because they weren't sure if the first one went through. So I'm just going to read them both. Um, have you experienced people go from extreme anxious states to nearly 100% okay overnight? Um, maintain okay, then think themselves back into not being okay again. I still think obsessive thinking that drives me into generalized anxiety. I'm truly hoping this is still anxiety. And I'm just going to go to the next same question. Um, I had five weeks of feeling fine. A lot of, um, I'm just kind of giving the general, it's a long question. Um, basically a lot of holiday stuff went on and, and, um, then started worrying, what if this tinnitus gets louder? Okay. Two days later, stuck back into anxiety, feeling depressed coming out as a pattern that's been ongoing for over a year now. I hope this is just anxiety with obsessive worry. It's the massive change between both states. And I think that's really the gist of that. Have you ever seen somebody Mm -hmm. go from just fine to completely anxious? So weirdly just fine to completely anxious. And it, it's a, it's a subtle version of that. Is this normal question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let me give you the reassurance. <laughs> so I've seen it many, many, many times and actually experienced it myself. I clearly remember, and I'll not forget that because it was so impressive. Really. I was having a set, set back. Well, I was stuck in that rumination cycle. I think it went on for about, two or three weeks and I was constantly in my head and then thinking and thinking and I tried to stop it but it, it didn't work I tried to stop it mm-hmm. <laughs> didn't work you notice the words and there was this one moment where I had like this light bulb going on that oh you're resisting <laughs> you are fighting this and I was like oh shit yeah yeah this is what I do I just need to drop the control and I did it and that day everything went away felt completely fine and i've seen this in in clients too so many times now obviously you you have to look for for the reason why you're feeling off we just talked about blowback anxiety after holidays so that might tie in but definitely if it's just a, a cognitive or behavioral thing that can change very very easily like it's the same when you step into an elevator and it's enough to have one weird thought so I'm like, oh my God, I'm alone in this. What if it gets stuck? There you go. There's the anxiety. And if the next time you you avoid the elevator, sure as hell, anxiety is going to creep in and you already started the loop. And as fast as the loop can get started, it's also possible for it to, to, to stop it very quickly. I would say, Michelle, what's right. your- And it can turn on and off quickly. It's supposed to turn on quickly. Remember, this is not a disorder coming back. This is your fight or flight response ringing, and it's designed to turn on fast. Because if it took 10 minutes for your body to go into survival mode, we would die all the time. Like we would, oh, um, there's somebody chasing me. All right. Well, in five minutes, my body will be at maximum capacity mode, and then I'll be able to run. It's designed. That's why it comes on as a whoosh, as a... (gasps) To fu- it's survival. And so whatever it thinks you need a whoosh of energy to survive for, it's going to whoosh you. And so again, you don't get to decide if you get whooshed or not. So you might be going five weeks of your alarm, not noticing any sort of threat or danger. And for whatever reason, you get a whoosh. And like, based on this question, totally fine. Five weeks feeling fine. Then I started getting involved in my what if thoughts of what if this ringing in my ears gets louder. Okay, so my assumption is that was your original perceived danger. You treated tinnitus as a threat. And so if you're treating, what if this gets louder? What if the thing I don't want to come back comes back? Here comes me acting like danger. So danger alarm rings. That to me is a sign of a perfectly functioning alarm system. It did mm-hmm. exactly what you told it to do. You are, you hit the oh shit button and hit it hit the adrenaline release button. And now, mm-hmm. so you got the initial whoosh. Your body will continue to send out whooshes as long as you keep your hand on the oh shit button. And so as long as you keep, so he, that initial whoosh, what? The oh, oh shit button. I love that. <laughs> you did it, right? We go, oh shit. And, and yeah. your alarm just knows, oh, uh, 
uh, right? It got an alert. The light went off. It was uh, adrenaline release time. Yes. And, so, and then you're like, oh, God. Oh, yeah. God. You see, that's proof that something's wrong because now I get more of this whoosh. Right? And then we fight that. And then as long as you keep fighting the whoosh, right? Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Oh, I have to keep fighting. Now you, your body's sending you fight energy that you're using it positively, it thinks, because you're still fighting until you stop fighting. And you don't have to stop being scared. You just have to stop fighting first. Scared leaves next. The fight has to stop first to give scared permission to leave. Scared is not going to leave if it sees fight is still present. Scared is the good guy. Scared is the feeling that shows around to protect you from danger. So until you start sending a message of safety, scared's going to stick around until it gets the message that you're safe and you can be scared and be safe. And that's why behavior change is important there. I hope that you're writing this down. That sounds like a good daily dare. Just saying. Somebody <laughs> write this down and send it in and we'll, <laughs> we'll say that you wrote the daily dare. <laughs> yeah. And what Michelle just said is, is really so important. I think we tend to forget that. And let's give um, let's give you guys an example. Maybe you, Michelle, also have an example from your personal anxiety story, how it felt like to be in that transition phase where you chose to, to not fight anymore, but you were still scared as hell. Right? Without that, you can't you can get on the other side. You, you just worded that perfectly, Michelle. It's so important that scared is still there but fight and, and then if if you don't fight scared gets the permission to leave you see i remember it on the phone <laughs> See, write good. that down turn that in <laughs> <laughs> I, when i was going I, I remember when i was going through through dp and i was so scared of it and then i was like okay i just need to reappraise the sensation I need to move through it not fight it and it was, I was so scared, like on a scale from zero to a hundred, it was 95. But with that 95% being scared, I went and, and had tea with my mom and I was listening to whatever she was telling me, nothing important while my head was telling me, what the fuck are you doing? This is horrible. This is horrible. Do something about that. And I was just sitting there and being present with it, but I was scared as hell. But I remember that this, this evening was a turning point. Because I felt like it was throwing the worst at me. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I can right. be scared. I choose not to fight. Yes, because your body sends you fear. You're not scared of things, right? If this is the thing that I'm scared of, right? Scared doesn't come from here. Scared, your body sends you scared. So you get scared. Your body sends you scared for things, okay? So fear is for something. Your body sends you fear for elevators. And so take a look and see if there's actual danger in the elevator, then I'm going to use fear for something. I'm going to use fear for fighting actual fightable things. But we don't have to fight just because fear showed up. Guys, fear mm -hmm. is the good guy. He shows up and gives you all this uncomfortable energy to send you into doing mode. As long as you stay in doing mode, your body will keep cranking out energy to keep you in doing mode. You have to send like, Speak back to your anxiety by your actions and behaviors. And the way you talk back to your anxiety is, oh, actually, we're safe. Oh, yeah, we're, I'm actually just having tea with my mom. So thanks, scared. Mm, you can come. I'm scared, but I'm looking. I'm also safe. And so the fact that I'm scared and I'm safe means once I start, my body gets the message that I'm safe, scared stops showing up so much. Yes, and maybe you can re remember in those situations, oh, what is the real danger and what is perceived danger? That, that's a big difference there. And I think the roller coaster analogy is so fitting. This is why we do that shit. We go on roller coasters to feel scared. So, I'll, And why do we feel scared? Because there is some level of risk that this could be dangerous. Our perceived level of danger is really mm -hmm. high. But we get into that seat because we know it's not true, right? It's weird. So you can feel like, oh, yeah, I'm in total danger while at the same time knowing exactly I'm not. But how, how can you move through that? Because there is such a big discrepancy. And this is with your behavior. Mm -hmm. By acting as if it's okay. By taking, taking that seat in that roller coaster. In real life, it's the same. If... 
uh, a thing that that a lot of people go through is being alone at home. Somebody who suffers from panic attacks or generalized anxiety and their partner goes on a business trip or something like, <gasps> and they dread being alone at home for weeks, for weeks before their partner leaves. And it's the same thing. I perceive that 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 I'm in real danger when I'm by myself because I might freak out and then lose it mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. nobody's is gonna find me and, and help me. But at the same time, you know exactly how ridiculous that is. How right. can you that's why being brain? home alone, unless that person was truly keeping you alive, like they plugged you into a wall and crank something <laughs> to keep you alive, that's real danger. Oh my gosh, you're leaving? Who's gonna crank me? Right? That's not real danger because somebody else's perception is different and that's that's your perception is formed by the story you tell about what's happening so like that example like the story is oh my god i am absolutely expecting something terrible to happen to me at any minute and nobody's going to be here to save me i would have been the opposite i my perception is i would rather die in a dark corner than have everybody there and looking at me and then I feel smothered and it's embarrassing and I have a problem. And so guess who was fine being alone? Guess who was like, <laughs> well, now I'm stuck in the backseat, too many people around here. What if they see me? And so that's why it's, it's really never the situation. Mm-hmm. It's your story about the situation determines your perception about that situation, which determines whether or not you fight it or not. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, okay. next question. You see it with the Did, thought DPDR? Number where four. is it? I've Number been very four. good. Coping. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I've been very good coping with my anxiety and I've overcome panic attacks and intrusive thoughts the past few weeks. I know it won't go away and my response is key. The only thing is D, DR and DP every second day. I seem to have it and I've just been going on as normal, but it does come But does it come less and less as you practice? Because some days it can get very frustrating as it hasn't been as much of a break towards my other sensations. Mm, Good question. Love it. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. Yeah, it's a a very, very, very common question. So this... All these other things faded away. This is the worst thing, whichever that happens to be for you, personal preference. This person's is DPDR. And and then comes the question that's hard, at least it's hard for me to answer. So this is the thing. I'm very frustrated because this thing still hasn't wiggled. This thing's still stuck. So if I keep practicing, accepting, and allowing, will this thing eventually go away? And how can I can I make it go away faster? Yeah. How can I accept more? <laughs> right. Like the answer is yes. But <laughs> the fact that you're asking that question, you're using accept and allow as a weapon. If I do it long enough, well, this well, well then I now this thing goes. Yes, as long as you leave shit alone, you stop noticing it so much because it's no longer marked as important to you. But if you're actually asking me that question, so I'll stop noticing this so much, so this will be a way, so I'll keep practicing, accept and allow. Do you have any other books you suggest? What about the, well, what about I'm listening to your podcast and I'm still trying really hard to accept and allow. This is, this is why it's hard for me to answer that because yes, you, as long as you just truly take on this mindset of fuck it and you find your fuck it and you notice the thing that's there and you just leave it alone, you you start treating this as unimportant. It starts fading because of unimportance. But if you're asking me, will this go away as long as I accept and allow, you're probably still trying to get rid of this, which means you're going to get frustrated because this thing's still going to be here. And this thing is going to, Gonna gonna continue to be there the more your nervous sensitization stays up, and it sure as hell will stay up if you keep fighting. It's interesting with DPNDR for a lot of people. It's the first thing that comes on with anxiety, and the last thing that goes away. They, it has this this tendency to to just stick around longer than other things. And obviously, if it's your most dreaded sensation. <laughs> then it will definitely stick stick around a, a longer time. But it's also linked to, to sensitization or rather desensitization of the nervous system. Sometimes we we feel like we, we are accepting, we're allowing, we're doing all the right things, taking care of, of ourselves. 
but still a symptom seems to linger. And this is maybe just a sign that your body just needs a little bit more time to get everything back into balance. Keep in mind, guys, like anxiety, having a wrapped up nervous system, it, it, that doesn't uh, just desensitize in, let's say, a week. Maybe your attitude is already there and your behavior is there, but your body just needs a little bit more time to catch up and allow it the time. The less you can, as Michelle said, um, focus on it and stare at it and wish it away and and um, notice how how weird everything feels and how much you hate this feeling and how disconnected you are from your children the worse it gets yeah leave well, it you're looking ruined. to see if it's gone the more you will guarantee to find it yes and a guaranteed way to make dp and dr worse is rumination promise that's the fastest way to get into it and the fastest <laughs> way to, to to stay in it rumination Staying away from rumination as much as you can is really key. Definitely. Cool. All right. All right. Next, trucking along. Oh, let's 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 answer. Let's go to number seven, I think, and let's just answer one more, mm -hmm. and then we'll have time to bring somebody in. Yeah. Yeah. Love okay. That. This one is this one has been sent in to customer service. This type of a lot about health anxiety lately. And so, mm -hmm. like, how come we don't talk about a lot about health anxiety? We need more information about health anxiety. More I'll help them, blah, 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 blah. We want a lot of information about health anxiety. And this is the most general question that was sent in. Overcoming health anxiety or health fears. Constantly panicking over every little thing. And so, because I just think it would be good to answer this one if we don't get to any more. Because I have seen so many posts on health anxiety. Plus, this is the season everybody actually gets Sick, right colds and flus and viruses yeah. and then hooking it to worst case scenarios so um so yeah health anxiety maybe we haven't maybe we haven't talked about it a lot lately so i even yeah, maybe something to, to <laughs> chat on but we have quite a few people who suffer from health anxiety in the dear community so it's not such a yeah raise your hand in the chat who's whose yeah. thing is health anxiety because it seems to be mm. oh look how fast that chat goes mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, health anxiety is really no different than, let's say, the structure of social anxiety or phobias or DPTR or, or whatnot. Obviously, it's different as it has uh, other triggers and, and other um, conclusions people draw on what they're afraid of, different core fears. But it, in the end, always ask yourself, what is keeping my health anxiety alive? What is keeping my social anxiety alive? What is keeping my phobias alive? And you say, I, I keep panicking at the, at, the, at the first symptom or something. And in that way, you can't help but panic. That's outside of your control. So if you hear your child cough or you see a minor rash on your body, you can't help but become anxious and say, like, yeah, oh my God, what is this? Why do I have this? What could this mean? So that's completely out of your control. Your anxious mind just seems to, to have latched onto that health stuff, but you have been feeding it. Don't forget that. You have been making this bigger. So it's the approach in overcome health anxiety is no different than the other anxiety forms. But to give you a concrete tip I like to use for health anxiety, which seems so trivial, but it's so helpful, is to kind of make a contract with yourself and say, I'm going to start changing my behavior. I can change the anxiety. I can change getting triggered. I can change becoming anxious as soon as I get triggered. But what I can change is all, all my behaviors, all the things that I'm doing to blow minor things out of proportion. And that everybody has their go-to safety avoidance behaviors that they engage in. That could be, I don't know, checking, Googling, making the 10th doctor's appointment and, and whatnot. Obviously, Zoe and Dr. Google. Mm -hmm. Yes. So promise yourself that whatever comes up, whatever triggers you, you can worry about it obsessively and as much as you like, and you can Google the shit out of it after three days have passed. Three days. That's the promise. No Googling for three days. You can worry about it and obsess about it but no behavior that would feed the health anxiety more. And if after three days, this thing is still there and it's still a cause for concern, you go and get it checked out. The good thing about this practice is that in 99% of the times, everything that has come up, it's going to settle itself in three days. And that will be the proof for you that, oh, hold on a second. I can actually start to trust my body. 
a little more and a little more. And if three days is, is too far of a stretch for you, fine. Start with one day. And then maybe the next day you can extend to two days. But it's, it's really baby steps in letting go of all of the behaviors that are feeding into your fear. Right? Health anxiety is so, it can be so intense because stakes are always high with health anxiety. I can choose to not step into that elevator, but I cannot choose to not have the heart attack or I cannot choose to not develop MS disease or, or whatnot. That's completely out of my control. And there's no safe zone from it. Obviously, it's the same with generalized anxiety. There is no break from it. It can happen anytime, everywhere. So it's your behavior that you, the only thing really that you can you can focus on. Right. Remember, you're not keeping yourself more healthy or more alive by staring at a certain part of your body. And so that goes for my blood pressure checkers that were not told by any doctor to actually check your blood pressure or checking your blood sugar when you were not told to check your blood sugar. And with the pulse ox machines, it like the health anxiety boil down to its simplest form. It's usually based in either um, I'm having a present sensation right now that I'm hooking to a worst case scenario, or I've been in a dangerous health related situation. Like, so now I'm having a memory of a health problem and I'm fighting the idea of what if it comes back. And sometimes people aren't even having physical sensations. It's just like, well, I'm just worried that there is something wrong with me, even though I can't find anything physically uncomfortable in my body. And it just becomes fighting ideas. And most health anxiety, remember, this is not about your health. I'm not telling you to not be prudent about your health. We're fighting imaginations of health problems. If you have an actual health problem, I'm not going to say, oh, I'm just there, I'm just, who cares? Attend to what you can attend to, because even if somebody has a diagnosis of something doesn't mean, again, fight right. So this guy screaming right now, that energy is now energy for now danger for now fight. So even if I have a weird little rash right here, that's not emergency room. Usually, right? Okay. Somebody's going to come find some like weird random rash that like it devoured a village of people. But let's just say I found a weird bomb. I found a weird thing. We tend to go black and white. <gasps> I need to get this checked right now. This means death. And we, we take one thing and our story goes so fast. We, we hook it to a worst case scenario. And so most of our distress is really it's our, we're, we're in the fight of our imagination and the topic just has to be, happens to be health. Somebody else's imagination, their topic is going crazy and they're just fighting all the things that get you to crazy. And somebody else is like, I don't give a shit about going crazy. I could really die <laughs> or whatever. You go crazy. You don't care anymore. You're crazy, but this could really be something. And so it, again, that's why it goes back to whatever this, this, the rash that devoured a village of people. Okay, Catherine, that'll be my next um, daily stare. <laughs> <laughs> and so That's great. check your story. What are the facts? And what's your story about the facts? If the facts are, holy crap, both my arms fell off and I'm having anxiety, oh, great. I don't care about your anxiety. Attend to your arms falling off. But if it was wow, this weird twitchy thing is happening in my head. Oh my gosh, what if it's some neurological disease, right? Well, when I have thought I had a neurological disease, if I didn't just have this weird one, one off little sensation, if I didn't get a whoosh, would it feel so important? Okay. And notice your story. We, we tend to like find present discomfort, tell a worst case shitty story, and then fight that story. So health anxiety has a lot to do with very creative brains imagining like, like right now I still just have a bump on my hand, but I'm already, my brain is involved looking at myself at my own funeral. And it's so sad. And look how sad everybody is at my funeral. First of all, you're never going to experience that, right? You're going to be dead. You won't even know what's happening. You won't even know who showed up, but this is us telling ourselves these the worst stories we can think of and desperately trying to prevent them from happening. And it's desperately trying to prevent things from happening that aren't happening 
that cranks out the energy with no place to go. Anxiety is energy with no place to go. And so as long as you keep stepping on the gas with your car in park, your anxiety will keep cranking out. So just notice how hard I'm pressing that gas pedal. What is my doing actually doing? Is Are my actions serving a purpose here? If not, let go a little bit. Okay, maybe I will see the doctor, but in three days. Or maybe mm-hmm. I'll I'll take notes of things that I'm ha- that's happening in my body, and on my next checkup, I'll tell them, "Oh, my legs have been cramping up a little bit more." We tend to go like immediately, emergency, emergency, emergency. And so I wouldn't be surprised if your every fluctuation you treat like an emergency, that and your body sends you into emergency mode. Again, signs of a perfectly functioning alarm system. Okay. Yeah, and. Something weird I would like to add to that, but think about it. Everybody who's struggling with health anxiety intensely, there's there's this weird story that our anxious mind likes to tell us, and that is that we could keep ourselves healthy and alive forever. And it's really helpful if you're struggling with this to have a date with yourself, sit down and try to accept the fact that you will die one day, no matter. No matter what you do, you will die, that's for sure. And that sometimes helps to, to let go of, the, of that sticky grip that you're putting on, on your health. I need to control this. I need to be safe. I need to be healthy 100%. To what extent? Because you're going to die one day. And I think if we are truly accepting the fact that someday it's going to be over, the health anxiety is not that relevant or not that intense anymore because it's so we know that we know rationally we're going to die and we can't avoid um maybe developing ms or cancer or whatever we can only do so much doing our best to keeping ourselves healthy we know rationally that that a lot of things are out of our control but still although we know that our anxious mind tries to, to convince us that we might just prevent it if we worry enough and get checked up enough. Right. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it's, it's this weird idea of if I just protect myself enough, I might live forever. Nothing's going to harm me. I'm going to be okay, I, which is, of course, not true because at the end, we are all, yeah. <laughs> Some days just, yeah. All right. So, on that happy mm-hmm. note, <laughs> we're all gonna die. <laughs> Y'all gonna die. So, um, okay. So we have three people with their hands raised. Okay. okay. So mm-hmm. I think if I click on your hand, you come onto the call with us. You won't be on video, but you will be on audio, and you can speak live to us. We have a few minutes, um, to talk a little bit. I don't know how to get you off the call. That's the fun part. So I can't. If you can figure out how to get off when we're done talking, get off or teach me how to take you off because <laughs> I, I couldn't figure it out last time. I'll play around. Um, so or we can just end the call by the time. Oh, yeah. Or we'll so, just end the call yeah. unless we mm-hmm. just have two quick questions or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I never know how they're going to go. So, um, okay. So I'm going to start at the top. And um, remember, it, your name will probably appear. If you're okay with that, stay on. This will be posted on all the social media platforms and everything. So if you're fine with that, we're fine with that too. All right, let's see. Let's bring somebody in here. Maisie? Hello. 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 Hi. <laughs> that was Welcome. a lot easier than last week. <laughs> <laughs> I was on my call last week. I even barely disappeared off the call and came back on, and then I got somebody on the call. <laughs> Hi. So Hi. we're all yours. What? Uh, oh yeah. So um, I did. I did send in a question, but um, my thing is um, when y- you're saying you know ask for more, when I ask for more. I'm getting more and mm-hmm. I end up like, you know, nearly passing out or, you know, being sick. And obviously that's a traumatic experience. So then, you know, I get, I get angry with <laughs> Barry's voice recorder. I'm thinking, I don't want more Barry because, you know, so how I know it's, you say, you know, not to fear those sensations, but um, it's very hard not to when you're like nearly passing out and things like that. Mm. 
good question. Thank you, Macy. Everybody else, can can anybody relate to that? I asked for more. Yeah, I asked for more, and, and I got some. What I the got hell, more. Mary? <laughs> <laughs> so my first question, Macy, would be like, what is your intention when you demand more of whatever you're fearing? Um, that, what are you trying to get with that? Yeah, I guess I don't know that I won't get more actually. So, <laughs> mm. or that I, I'll get more, but it won't be too much more. And it's actually like I can then say, hey, I survived more, but it's not actually, you know, too much more. <laughs> just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If yeah. we go into that back and forth, like, give me more. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't give me more. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, give me more. You can give me more. I can take it. Bring it on. No, just kidding. Not too much more. Just a little bit more. And then we get stuck in that whole, like, just a little bit more. No, 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 that much. That's too much. Yeah. Bring it back. Then that's still bring it like, give me more, like running towards something. It sends this message. Like if there was danger, you would run flee from, right? You wouldn't, you would run away, not run towards. And so even just, just your words of like, and then I felt like I was going to pass out. And then I asked for more and then I nearly passed out. So that's how I would talk to. I really almost threw up this time. It was so close. It didn't happen. But I almost, almost, almost did. And I was just on the brink of, for for you, it's passing out. For me, it was throwing up. For somebody else, it would be crazy. Like, I really, I was on my one one last thread (laughs) of sanity. I was so close. I could see crazy on the other side. Bullshit for all three of us. (laughs) Totally, totally, perfectly your word is, Michelle. I know I asked what the intention was because sometimes we're not even aware that we're doing it with the wrong intention. We're like, okay, let's, just dip my my toe into the water and and let's see how this turns out. But what that really translates into is what Michelle just said. I'm still afraid and I am only demanding more if you're actually not giving me more. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. now you're giving me more. Right. right? And so now I'm afraid. So, oh, no, I, I can't do that now. So demanding more is really about increasing your um, willingness to be uncomfortable. And you can do that slowly in stages by accepting and allowing and not caring and not being impressed. Or you can get really mad and say, you know what, let's get this over and done once and for all. So do your worst anxiety, whatever it is you are fearing, demand that you do faint. So just saying, give me more, maybe it's not specific enough. If your core fear is fainting, passing out, then demand that to happen. This is how you would address your core fear heads on. I think everything else is just, no, let me take a look how this feels. <laughs> it's good enough. Yeah. And then it's usually doomed, doomed to fail. Sure. Yeah, it's um I it's definitely helping for sure. I've been um housebound for four months now and I've started exposure therapy f- um three days ago and I'm sharing I'm sharing my journey on TikTok to help others or to try and help others. But yeah. it's um so it I definitely it is helping, but um it's a very unnatural thing to ask for more. Um oh, totally. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's like there's nothing more unnatural than than this. Mm. Yeah. And it, it's such a foreign concept. When when have we been taught to actually run towards the thing that, that scares us or that threatens to harm us? It's very counterintuitive to do that. Yeah, yeah. And also, I'd just like to say, I watched your um, video on the um, DPDR. And honestly, I was in tears for most of it because of how comforting it was for me. So thank mm. you for that. I suffer with, you know, dissociation and the fear of going crazy all the time and just mm. hearing that you know it was really lovely to know I'm not alone so thank you oh thank you you know Maisie you sound like you have a really good alarm system this guy is like your super duper best friend and he's mm-hmm. really good at showing <laughs> you everything that could he's showing you all the coulds and they all still could if I didn't pass out this time I could pass out next time so could mm-hmm. I so could Ida we both could break our legs when we get up from this chair anything could but mm. if you're bracing your, if I'm purposely not leaving my house because of could, right? Then coulds, this guy, like he was never designed to help you fight coulds. He's designed to fight you what is. And so like, a, a, like another way of running towards, again, this is not what Aida said this and Michelle said this. They're just different <laughs> ways of sending mm. this message of like, 
Like here comes this feeling of dizzy or lightheaded or whatever you might have, right? And then you get a whoosh. Here comes fear for dizzy. Here comes fear to help you fight dizzy. And the way you treat dizzy now, it's, whoa, hold on. Feels like I'm gonna pass out. First of all, that's not a feeling. It's a feeling plus a prediction. Feeling is I feel lightheaded. The prediction is that means I'm going to pass out. So stop a second and let's see. That's why I like those terms. Let's see. Oh, hold on. Okay, hold on. I feel I feel like I'm going to pass out. So let's see. I've got 10 seconds to pass out. So, all right. I, thank you, Alarm, for alerting me to possible passing out. I'm now going to sit down and wait. And let's just see if my body passes out. Okay. I got alerted for it. And so let's give it a chance to see what my body does. Mine would have been throw up. Somebody else's would have been heart attack, whatever. Okay, my alarm alerted me to danger. Let's see if danger shows up. And in 10 seconds, 20 seconds, right? Like the 21 second countdown on the app. It's, oh no. Oh, it turns out I was just dizzy. Okay, carry on. Diffuse a lever and tours is supposed to be kind of like, quick, like a shift in a mindset, and then spend as little time as possible here and back to life. Whoop, just got alerted to something. Let's take a look. Oh, something terrible is about to happen. All right. Well, how long am I going to sit here and wait for something terrible to happen? I could sit here my whole life and wait for something terrible to happen. Mm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and and keep in mind it's early days for you. You said you just started three or four days ago with exposure yeah. therapy. Yeah, well, so I've had um, anxiety for 13 years, and I've never really, since I was 10, um, and I've never really uh, dealt with it in this way. So I'm hopeful that I can finally conquer and learn to live with, you know, this this thing that I have. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah learn we're not going to conquer anything. No, I knew, I knew, I knew that was going to be wrong. <laughs> this guy's confused. He's ringing at the wrong time. So you're going to gently and kindly take him by the hand and go, oh, you think when I leave my house, it's danger? So you're going to send me a whoosh for me leaving my house? I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm scared. I'm shitting a brick right now, but I'm safe. And so thank you so much for the fear. Thanks. Fear comes with a big red bow on top. Thank you so much, but I actually don't need to use it to flee home right now unless something shows up that needs fleeing from. But I don't flee because of flee energy. I use flee energy to flee from things. And then you get better at having these whooshes. And when you don't just leave because there's a whoosh, his filters kind of get reset back to his original factory settings. That's it. Yeah, I think because I haven't been, I've been running away as soon as I feel that for 13 years, I've got a lot of sort of right. rewiring to do. So I'm trying to be patient with myself and um, yeah, continue. Mm. Good. Well, keep us posted. Thank you Definitely. so much. Yeah. And two final tips. So whenever this little red guy throws anxious thoughts at you, oh my God, what if you pass out? What if you go crazy? What if you die? There is one universal answer that is always fitting and always helps. And that is saying, Okay, nothing I can freaking do about it. All right. Sure. That's it sounds it's that sounds so simple, but it really contains all the their philosophy is in that sentence. Okay, all right, I accept nothing I can fucking do about it. I let go of control. Do your worst. I run towards. And I'm gonna wait 10, 20, 50 seconds, and then I'm gonna say, well, nothing happened. And move on with your life and repeat and repeat and repeat the letting go of the control behavior and control behavior sometimes is, is not an obvious behavior but sometimes the attitude mm-hmm. and and yeah. uh, and control in form of rumination and and compulsions and checking right sure. the more you, you let go of these the, the more everything gets back into balance it's hard but you can absolutely do this thank you that's great thank you so much you're welcome. welcome. I think I Thank can. you for coming on. Oh, sorry. Oh, I did it. I did there it. You go. I didn't mean to send you off that quickly, but okay, I did it. <laughs> good. All right. I think that was a good start off. Michelle, um, are we done? Are we covering more questions? What no, are, what I think, do you want to bring in one more person? And I know we're a little over, but do you want to bring in one more? And we'll, we can, we'll if you want to. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see who else. Okay, let's. See who's next. Oops. Oh, Jill. 
I think I just brought you in. Can you hear us? I, I don't even know if you get a notification that you're here. Let's see. Jill, hi. Or maybe she she didn't want to join. Maybe it was an accident. Okay, so let's take you back off. Remove permission. I'm getting good at this. Okay, yeah, Hannah. Let's see. Let's bring Hannah. Hi, you're here. If you take yourself on mute, you off mute. You can say hi. Hi, Hannah. Hello. Oh, good. Hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um. Oh, blimey, I'm scared just being on here. <laughs> ah, then you're on the right call. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm i 37. I've been agoraphobic now since I was 21. I, um, I also can't be alone either at all. I haven't been alone in my house or out of my house for at least 10 years um and it's got to the point where I've been having panic attacks like when I'm trying to have a bath mm -hmm. like silly situations that didn't bother me before it's like creeped in where my house used to be sort of I wouldn't I wouldn't say necessarily a safe place but I guess it was a safe place and then I started having panic attacks in situations like having a bath mm -hmm. um I don't know I just feel like it's a really scary place to be when I can't even walk out of my house by myself you know like two doors down the road um I just don't know how to get out of it because that feeling of when the panic hits and um I just you, you can't think straight I feel like I'm gonna go crazy I just need to escape I need to get mm -hmm. out I can't I just can't seem to push myself into the situations to go and do anything <laughs> about it I, I just right. feel so stuck I don't know how to even tackle this yeah and I'm gonna sound like a real jerk but you're in the perfect spot to do this because mm -hmm. this is this is when we'll get people from dare when for, at, at dare and who like you're you're gonna find your fuck it you have not found yours yet if you've seen my video i, I did last week i had these little silver balls mm -hmm. um it's really this so what happens is oh i was out living life and then i had a panic attack at work so i stopped going to work and then i went out a little bit um to see friends but then i had a panic attack out with friends and now i i only like go out to get the mail but then i had a panic attack when i leave my house and then so this guy oh, that that is literally i <laughs> oh yeah i i i know i looking back i know i was always anxious um i remember when i used to go out when i had friends and would do stuff and could go out alone i remember having looking back definitely having social anxiety and just being a general warrior and being mm -hmm. on high alert a lot because of my childhood and everything but how it started was when i um i had my own business and i was walking to work to get like healthy and fit on the way to work random panic attack out of the blue and then so from that point all the avoidance behaviors came mm -hmm. in so i ended up stopping working but then I could still go to the shop. Then I had a mm -hmm. panic attack when I went to the shop. Yeah. So I stopped going to the shop. I'd get a taxi to the shop and make it wait for me and then return. Then I couldn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that I, all the little things, all the little, every time I was triggered, I've then avoided that situation. It got to the point where, because one night when I had a panic attack, when I was still living alone, um, I called everyone in my phone and nobody picked up. And That's um, why you don't stay alone. Yeah. And since then, I haven't even been out. I can't even turn my phone off. I don't do the updates on my phone because I'm too scared that I won't be able to reach anyone. And I know, even though I'm never home alone and I've got my phone, I know that the people around me don't cure, like they don't fix it when I'm panicking. Mm -hmm. But it's like the go to thing. If I panic, I have to phone someone. Um, and yeah, it's just the, the avoidance is it, 
it comes with everything. Like even I remember years ago, oh, you know, caffeine was bad for anxiety. So you cut out caffeine. Um, just every, like drinking. I used to drink alcohol, not a lot, but I would have a drink. And then it was like, oh, no, if you drink alcohol, you're going to lose control and you won't have control over yourself. So don't drink. So I haven't had a drink in 15 years. So, yeah, everything just sort of you just avoid, avoid, avoid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and but how about when, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Mm-hmm. No, so how on. about you don't you don't start to tackle this with specific situations mm. and behavior but how about you start really really small ask if if you're too afraid to start somewhere you can you can ask yourself what is the next smallest thing that i could manage to do that maybe doesn't send me into 100 panic mm. maybe doing the update on your phone that could be something yeah. that is <laughs> so i literally i literally um I'm this bad that since I found the Dare app, I had to because I've got a spare phone just in case this phone breaks. So, say something happens with this phone, I've got another phone. I can't be without a phone. So, I've got Dare, the Dare app on my other phone. And the other day, I just thought to myself because I, I have done, say, with the bath was a trigger, which never used to be, it used to actually be my relaxing mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. I could stay in there for an hour with the music on and I was fine. So when that ha- when I had a panic attack in that situation at the beginning of last year, I just felt like I was robbed of like part of my peace, like part the like last little bit. Something else stolen from me. All I had left was a bath, and now I can't even take a damn bath because I got a freaking panic attack in a bath. And I'm just gonna sit still for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. But you need to I mean, reverse I- that spiral, I- Hannah. It's it's so important that you that you start somewhere. You start somewhere and, and then you tackle bigger situations. Maybe you start with a phone and then you take a bath and you totally expect to have a panic attack. And you don't go with the expectations to have a relaxing bath. You go take a yeah. bath, totally expecting you're going to have a panic attack. And, you know, the, the driver, the, the driving factor for you to start doing this is really oh. the quality of your life. Yeah, it sounds See, I so just simple, don't. but it's yeah I just don't I've, that's what I feel like I just don't have a quality of life anymore because I'm not doing anything like even where where I was stuck at home and I've lost friends during all of this so I don't have any friends there's no one coming around or anything um it's like oh, I forgot where I was going with that then because I have started with the bath so I started having a bath and I'd listen to the Dare app of you know, the SOS ones on the Dare app. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I must say as well, I do have baths and showers <laughs> every day. I am clean. <laughs> I don't want people to think I'm like not having a bath at all. But it was just, um, I felt like I was r- like rushing doing it. So I've been making myself sort of sit there and just say, you know, it's fine. Like if you panic, you panic. If you don't, you don't. It's just whatever. Just stay in it. Mm-hmm. And then literally um yesterday and last night I turned my phone off for the first time um just I just said to myself just do it because there's just you're gonna feel the the because uh, this is how bad it is my my dare subscription re- uh, was due to be renewed and it did for some reason it didn't work so it said I wasn't a premium thing so I couldn't get onto the SOS I panicked over that <laughs> not being able to get mm. um onto the app but this is what i'm saying it's like all yeah. these sort of i've got so many safety behaviors and then so many things i avoid um but that's okay <laughs> hannah you're not alone with that those things tend to accumulate over time and you mm. know the the good thing about anxiety is and i'm saying a good thing it generalizes meaning if i start to fear uh being trapped in an elevator i might be i might start to fear being trapped in an mri but it goes the same way around so if i do master to go into an elevator and overcome my fear that will have an effect on on how i feel and how how i face maybe car car washes or mris or whatnot so Mm -hmm. it goes both ways so don't think of it oh i have 
127 avoidance behaviors and I need to work through all of them. Right, it's right. Not it. I'm going to tackle one and then tackle another. You're going to no. be broke. Yeah. Not, yeah, it's not like that. Yeah. Because yeah. you know what? The common denominator of everything you're describing is you are embattled with fear. And mm -hmm. fear is just showing up in different places and you're leaving. It has nothing to do with your walk to work. You stop walking to work because fear showed up for whatever reason and you mm -hmm. left. And so fear is just mm -hmm. like, oh, must be danger. We're going to keep sending her fear every time she goes. So now mm -hmm. this guy is running your show. He was yeah. not designed to run the show. You run the show. Like you are the, I did, you wrote that one, right? You're the, the CEO or what's mm -hmm. the CEO. So like, this guy is the assistant. You are the boss. He is designed to ring and go, I got had a look, look la, 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 do something. <laughs> and you do something yeah. every time. And, yeah. and now it's like, he's just, and you're only doing something to shut him up. Shh, 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 we'll stay home. We won't do anything. We'll never leave our house ever again. It's like, okay. And then he's like, get out of the bathtub. And you're like, God damn it. All right, I'll get out of the bathtub. And so, yeah. and, and now- now it's time to just be fucking done. And by the time when people get to that point where they're pa having panic attack in their safe place, that's usually mm -hmm. when they find their fuck it. They're like, you know what? Yes. Fuck it. If I'm going to have a panic attack in the bathtub, yeah. I might as well go outside and I might as well get the mail. And I might as well just, if I'm feeling scared everywhere, do it. Bring yeah. it. And that's and where the rock bottom comes in. Yes. Yes. When you hit rock bottom, that's oftentimes the best place to be and, and to start to start from the very beginning and do things differently. Because I'm sure you have you have tried to tackle this this issue many, many times. Yeah. And so this will not be your, your very first time trying to overcome your anxiety. But sometimes you need that rock bottom feeling and you need to see that, oh, my God, my behaviors and my fear of fear is, is stealing all the quality of my life. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy because when I, my, I think that, say, for instance, when I was in the bath and I would wash my hair, as soon as I've committed to that, as soon as my hair was wet and I put the shampoo on, that's it, I'm freaking out because you mm -hmm. think you can't just get out stressed, of this. You're stuck, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and then when... I, I just don't think I helped myself obviously after that where I thought all I could think was this is utterly ridiculous this is completely out of control now if you can't even wash your hair like if don't judge your hair... don't judge don't exactly judge. don't, don't <laughs> ever exactly... ever ever judge <laughs> yeah don't be aware of that you can't you you can't control if, if you feel fear when you wash your hair yeah, it might be there, it might not be there. What you have complete control over is how how you judge yourself, whatever is going on at the moment. Right, and how Don't you treat that. And how you treat the presence of fear, and so like put it in the same yeah. category of any other feeling. Like I'm in the bathtub. Why can't I feel fear? I can feel sad in the bathtub. I can feel angry in the bathtub. I can feel horny in the bathtub. Why can't I feel scared in the bathtub? Michelle. <laughs> I, I, know. I know. I mean, I'm just saying. Sometimes feelings just show up. So just feel them. I don't have to do anything about them. I'm just saying. I, 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 I think that's the other thing. Like, I, 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 it's, definitely been a more recent thing that I've realized that it's not just fear I think I've had a thing of not being upset like I, I've not allowed myself to be upset like even crying I had this thing in my head if I start crying I'll never stop crying so just yeah, don't so cry that's don't that's be where upset. you like lock in and control don't let the bad stuff happen because I'm yeah. I'll be sad forever if I'm scared I'll be scared forever I'm gonna hit yeah. some permanent switch and be stuck in if I had a panic attack in the bathtub what if I just have a panic attack sitting here and that means I have a panic attack every day 24 7 for the rest of my life oh my gosh I can't live like that why am I saying I can't live like that does that mean I don't want to live <gasps> I don't want to have those thoughts and then like we just, <laughs> I've, just I've, done, I've done that as well I said I I I had that I've never been you know suicidal or had any thoughts of those things but when you have that flash of oh this is just so bad like what's the point and that what's the point scared me Maybe another so one yeah yeah because yeah. it's literally totally like, normal there's no place else to hide and so if there's no danger you're hiding from mm. find your fuck it 
and you find it and you use it because aren't you, you're still scared, right? You didn't fight it away. So your action really didn't do so much except (laughs) give you more fear. So now it's like, you know what? Fuck it. And if I go crazy, I go crazy. At least I'll go out and have ice cream while I'm going crazy. (laughs) And you take that attitude and you, that's how, if you're going to go do exposure therapy, you're going with that intention, not Okay, I walk through steps from my house and I feel like I'm being licked by kittens. Okay, good. This was a success. Here you go, <laughs> therapist. Here's $450. Not that. Not. Going out so you can get a better relationship with scared. You have a yeah. disordered relationship with fear. Fear mm-hmm. is not the disorder your relationship is. And so we're going to work on this piece where it's like, oh, I could be scared in the bathtub. Now I'm going to do a hot oil treatment on my hair. I could sit here for 10 minutes and be scared. Scared's not danger. And it seems like over the time you've, you've attached the, every time fear shows up, that means there's danger and it's not. And, but when you change how you act, when fear shows up, you'll start changing the meaning of that fear. So you guys, I'm sorry. I have to run. I need to wrap up here. Michelle. Hannah, Me too. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Hannah, thanks for who was joining us. On uh, the chat. Thank you so much both of you thank All you so, so the much best to you guys thank you take for care everybody today till next we'll time the next one. thank bye. you bye, bye. bye. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.